Okay, guys. Now, I know it's painful because it isn't the prettiest setup in the world, but it is electrically correct. It is all 5 watt. All the resistors are 5 watt, and it will work very well. So, let me show you what I have here. First, let's take a look at the schematic, okay? What we have here is ground. It sits right in the middle of the can dome. On either side of ground, we have voltage dividers, you know, little voltage divider setups. On this left side, you've got a 20 ohm and a 225 ohm. And of course, on the right side, you've got a 10, 10K, 13.5K, and an 8K. And they go off to various places, including B plus right here. So here's the deal. Um, I don't have a 13.5. I don't have uh, a 225. I didn't have an 8. And actually, I didn't have any 10s. Ray Elko didn't have those exact um, values either in a in a five watt resistor, so I may do with what I did have, and it's going to work fine. Let me show you again on the uh, on the terminal strip. Now, please remember that my aim was to make a single terminal strip, just like the candome, so that all the wires that went to the candome, the leads that went to the candome, would go to this terminal strip. The reason I wanted to do that is it would be easy for the next technician 40 years from now to understand what I was trying to do here. I could have distributed these resistors into various places in the circuit and would have been just fine. And I would have run some wires maybe, but that would have been about it. Gone through a 220 ohm right here. I did not have a 5 ohm, nor did Ray Alco, but they had a 3.9. So what I have here is a 223.9 and a 20 ohm. 223.9 is pretty darn close to 225, close enough for, for government work and close enough for me. Okay, so 223.9 goes to this terminal right here. Oh, yes, right here. From this terminal, I have a 20 ohm 5 watt resistor right here going off to ground potential. That's exactly what we had in that schematic. We had a 225 and a 20 right to ground. Okay, this, this terminal right here will be ground potential. Now on the other side, on the other side I had an 8K. Hmm, I didn't have any 8Ks. Now this looks odd, guys, but believe me, it works, and it works really well. I've done this before. I have an 8K. It starts right here. Okay, that's where I'll tie to where the outside of the 8K would be. Goes through 500 ohms, then 7,500 ohms, which, um, even with the new math I learned in grade school, that adds up to 8,000 um, to this point right here. Okay, so I have 8K. Then I go from this point through a 6.8K, all right, right here. I tie another 6.8K to it right there, but nothing else ties to that terminal. That's just a junction point for these two 6.8Ks. 6.8K, 6.8K right there. 6.8 and 6.8, in my math, even with the new math I learned in grade school, adds up to 13.6. All right. So, we've got 13.6, which is pretty darn close to 13.5K. All right. 13.6K to there. Now, I have 220Ks in parallel. And according to all the things they taught me in engineering school, 220Ks in parallel really is 110K, okay? And I have the added bonus that I've actually improved the power dissipation capabilities of this 10K, okay? 10K goes off to here, and what is here? Here is ground potential. The only snag I see in this whole arrangement is going to be a little bit tough securing this one to the floor of the chassis. That's no big deal. I've got some small screws. I'll probably wind up putting the nut on the other side. And uh, usually I can tighten the nut. As long as I have a decent hold on the screw, I can get that, nice, that nut nice and tight. Of course, this side won't be a problem. So I'll have to drill one hole because I'll use one of the existing holes. I'll drill one hole and I'll attach this. So just to review, okay, just to review. From ground potential on this side, I go through a 20 ohm. All right, there's that first terminal off the of ground. Then I go through 20, 223.9 ohms, 
to the second terminal from ground. Okay, that's one side. On this side from ground, okay, I go through the 20K, okay, just like in the schematic, 20K, that's two 10Ks in parallel, or <laughs> correct me, I, I'm going through 10K, two 20Ks in parallel, okay, so I've got a 10K here. And then I go through two 6.8s in series, that gives me 13.6, all right, 13.6K. Then I go through a 7500 and a 500 ohm in series, and I wind up with 8K right there, and that's at the outside of the candle. So this whole mess is electrically correct. It will dissipate, uh, it will dissipate power very well because I've broken, you know, these are all 5 watt resistors. And I've taken basically 13.6K here and spread it across two 5-watt resistors, which is really like a 13.K uh, over a 10-watt resistor in terms of heat. So as goofy looking as it is, I'll tuck it in the radio. It'll take up no more space than that candle did, and the wires will, will not have to be changed. They'll land in relatively the same position, and so uh, I think we'll be good. All right, guys, here's a look at the schematic of the power supply stuff I've been working on. There's that voltage divider. You notice how I have the A, B, C, D, and E, and F. Those are these points right here that I labeled on the chassis. That way I could find where the wires go. By labeling them on the chassis and on the schematic, then I could make sure that I connected all the wires into the right place. I knew it would be a little bit tough to see everything on that, that uh, terminal strip once I installed it. And I've already colored in, in, uh, in highlighter here the things that I've already finished. And uh, I'm now getting to where I'm going to hit those caps. And this will start filling in with yellow very quickly. Oh, by the way, that capacitor in the little metal box, this one right here, it's hard to see, but this is a 0 0.012 microfarad 1000 volt. Well, there it is right there. That is a 0 0.012 microfarad 1000 volt. There's the call out in the parts list. And all that is is a line filter capacitor. So I have some 0 0.015s that are a thousand volt and they'll work just fine in that slot. I probably will not restuff that box, but we'll see. Because to do that I have to drill out rivets and so forth and, and I don't really think that's necessary. All right guys, let me show you what we have done so far. Now you have installed that terminal strip. It looks very complicated, but it's really simple. I already showed you how this, how it's all laid out. But I've installed that, hooked all the wires that were connected to the terminal strip to their respective terminals, and connected all the components. I've replaced some new components, you know, some resistors, some capacitors. And uh, so I can now work away from this part and get on to doing all these caps that are out here okay you see you know here's lots and lots of caps so I'm gonna I'm gonna go about replacing these guys I will probably replace the resistors here too because the other dog bones that I've measured have been high so these will come out especially this this uh, high wattage resistor this looks like a I think it's probably a uh, it might be a one watt but I think more it's a two watt resistor and so I'll go ahead and replace all those guys. And then really, there's not going to be much more to do in this chassis once I get all these caps and these resistors replaced. I do have some electrolytics to do. This one right down here is a uh, double cap. In other words, there are two electrolytic capacitors built into this can. And this one up here is a single. Neither of, the, neither of these are original. I, I'm... I don't know about whether I'll restuff them or not. The only reason I would restuff them is to save space and not have to drill holes, but um, they can be such a pain to restuff, and you know it's the kind of thing that often the owner doesn't care at all about. Remember, if I'm doing these for someone else, I have to. I, I'm really worrying about what do they want, and if they're paying me to do this and it takes me a lot of time and I have to charge them more to restuff it, well then they may not want that and. To me, it's perfectly fine to not restuff. I know it's a philosophical thing. So I'm looking at this mica mold here, and I doubt that that's a mica cap. It might be, but I, I kind of doubt it. So 
you know, we'll check all that out. It, um, sometimes it'll say mica on the, the schematic if one is a mica. So I'll go ahead and, and check that out if I can. I'm going to hit this band switch coming up real soon. Basically, I'm just going to clean the band switch. Real easy to get to all the wafers on this band switch, so that should be a snap to do. All right, so I'll get back to work now. Okay, guys, there is the bottom of the chassis with all the caps and resistors replaced. You will notice there's not a single dog bone left in there. Every single one of them was high, every single one, and I tested them all. And, of course, I replaced all the caps. Okay, guys, I've uh, installed the reproduction cloth-covered cord. It looks pretty good. And uh, I've got a little uh, UL knot there. And I, I like to put it sometimes the knot in front of a grommet if I don't think the knot is going to be enough to hold it into the radio. So I just put a little grommet on there. Grommet fits kind of tightly on the cord, so it just provides a little cushion there. A little extra strain relief. Of course, you can see that uh, the line voltage comes in here, goes through the fuse. Goes through the fuse and it goes out this wire here that goes on all the way up to the power switch on the tone control. And then, of course, returns all the way back the other side. And it comes down to this little, this little terminal strip here. And then, of course, the transformer uh, primary is connected to this right here where that comes back from the switch. And then the other side of the line goes directly to this uh, part of the terminal strip here that has the other side of the primary. Real simple. I put a one and a half amp fuse. Sometimes I can get by with a one amp fuse. I just, uh, I'll take a look at the current draw when it's all done. It's probably going to be around a half an amp. So a one amp fuse would probably work just fine too. I have installed the uh, the uh, power supply filter capacitors. I like to use terminal strips in lieu of restuffing those cans. And I didn't drill any extra holes for these terminal strips. Just just uh, used existing screws and adapted the mounting. On this one here, uh, these capacitors are grounded to the chassis, so. I usually will put a, uh, I will heat up the chassis in that area with my big honking uh, soldering gun. And then I'll go ahead and put a glob of solder there as, as a good ground. And I've installed a .005 uh, microfarad safety cap. Now I know that Schemo calls for a .015. But when it comes to line filter caps, it's really not important what the value is. What is important is that it be a safety cap. And um, so that's what we've done. Getting close. Uh, pretty much done with the work under here. I've got to clean the switch, the uh, band switch, and clean those two pots. And that should about nail it under here. And time to get cracking on that tuning condenser and get it installed and get the wires connected back up to this band switch. So I'll get to that next. Now, I have never worked on a radio before where I had such nice access to both sides of the band switch. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of that by uh, cleaning the top and the bottom of it with this deoxid up close and personal. Uh, of course, if I could get a deoxid can that worked, um, that would be real nice because this is not going to do really very much good. Oh well. You know the drill, you spray the deoxid on there pretty liberally, and uh, then you work it for a while. And then after you've done that, you let it sit, maybe give it a quick blast, let it sit, and then do a flushing spray. I try to work it at least 40 or 50 times when I'm doing this. I, they say 20 times, but I figure that's probably more times than this thing will generally see in a year, but um, I want to make sure it's going to work well. 
I'll also put a drop of uh, sewing machine oil right here on the shaft where it, where the it enters into the uh, the hollow shaft, the threaded part. That will just help it to stay smooth for a long time. All right, now we'll turn it the other way and we'll do a similar thing on the other side. Well, I'm on my last can of this garbage. All right, set the spray at low. Already costs too much. I may as well see about taking care of these pots they actually look pretty well sealed and this one's stiff as anything the first thing you have to do when you have a really stiff pot is go ahead and lubricate the shaft so that you can kind of take care of that part of it see that's pretty tight so I'll put a few drops of oil there and see if that helps it seems there are a couple of people that object to the use of sewing machine oil on radios. I'm not quite sure why. It, it's basically a light machine oil is all it is. It has excellent lubricating properties. Okay, so that loosened it some, but not really enough. It's definite that this problem is internal, and I don't see a good way to get inside there. This is one of those stupid plastic sealed ones. Sometimes you can find a way in but it's not easy sometimes you kind of have to blast your way in using the same opening or the same gap between the shaft and the uh, the uh, threaded part with a little bit of deoxid you just have to kind of blast it in there I've had that work many times it makes a mess but usually enough of it will get in there to help so I can feel it loosening up now and it's definitely not from the shaft part, it's from inside the pot. It doesn't take getting much in there to work, but you have to get it in there. Sometimes there's enough of a, of a uh, wiggle room in the shaft that if you just push it down opposite the, direction, the opposite the side that you're spraying into, you can get some in. I do apologize for the poor camera work, guys. I did the best I could, but uh, I don't know. I, I guess I missed that one. Quite a bit looser. And like I said, I don't think it's coming from lubricating the shaft itself. It's actually getting inside. Now let's set this thing down. What a mess that stuff makes, eh? Okay. Now, we want to clean this area up here. Nothing to it. A little bit of lacquer thinner will take care of that in no time. Just that it'll be awfully hard to get to later so now is the time so I haven't checked yet because I haven't turned on the computer but I understand that old Buzz is doing a uh, video series I heard through the uh, YouTube grapevine that old Buzz is doing a video series on a Helicrafters 7 inch uh, electrostatic CRT um, uh, television set so the T506 used the 7JP4 tube, which a lot of other TVs used. I have a couple of Emersons that used it. Um, I have a couple of Motorola VT71s that used that tube. It, I guess it was the sort of 7-inch tube. You know, if you're make, going to make a 7-inch TV, that's the tube you used. Anyway, I understand that Old Buzz is going to do a video series on that TV. And uh, I'm real happy about that because I just picked up one of those today at an antique store. Got a really good, pretty good price on it, but then again, good is relative because my television um, may not even have a good tube. I was not able to test it, and that's risky. I, I wouldn't normally do that, except I, I'm particularly fond of the Helicrafters TV sets. Hey guys, looky what the cat dragged home today.
The other day, wifey and I went to the antique store because she wanted to bum around, and I saw this thing sitting there, but instead I bought a little RCA portable. But this thing was gnawing at me for a few days. I really wanted to have this. The price was a little bit high, and I wasn't too sure about the uh, 7JP4 that sits in it. But it was bothering me enough that I finally had to go back and get it. And I did get them to come down significantly on the price because I plugged, <laughs> I plugged it in and uh, we tried it and no picture came. But there was also a bunch of missing tubes. So I, both, I, so I told them I can't really tell about the CRT because it's missing all these tubes. And oh, by the way, I'm going to have to buy all these tubes too. So they came down quite a bit on price. And I dragged this old thing home. This is a 1948 Helicrafters T506. Really cool TV. I've always wanted one of these push-button Helicrafters. It's the second Helicrafters TV I have, but I've not worked on either one of them, obviously. And uh, I'm looking forward to this one. The cabinet's pretty straightforward, and it'll need some help. You can see that it's got some veneer issues. No big deal. And it is missing the back. And here's a real quick look inside. As you can see, there's some missing tubes in there. Maybe you can't see. But there are. There's actually a, quite a few missing tubes. But that's okay. I have buckets of tubes, so I think I can make that work. And uh, when I did turn it on, just to do our quote-unquote demo to see if it worked, um, actually I got pretty loud audio, so I'm pretty sure the audio circuits are working okay. It's just going to be, are the video circuits uh, okay, and is that CRT good? And uh, I have a... Uh, Sencor CR70 on the way to uh, help me to check out all of all of the various 7JP4s I have laying around here because I do have you know there's a tube in each one of those TVs that I mentioned and I have at least one good 7JP4 sitting on the shelf so that's a good thing too um, but I will, I'm really excited about watching Buzz's vid series because Buzz is pretty good he's a really smart guy and he makes it fun so it should be a real interesting thing to have Coupled with Bob Anderson's TV series on the 506 he did, or video series on the 506 that he did, there will be some good resources out there on a TV that I want to get started on. Um, I, you know, I'm a little intimidated by televisions, guys. I, I may have mentioned that before. Um, I just don't have any experience with them. It's not that I don't understand how they work, but it's how they were built that, that I don't have experience with. So, And how to troubleshoot. I was never a technician, so... It's going to be a lot of fun learning, and uh, you can't ask for better teachers than Buzz and Bob, so it should be pretty cool. Now, you know that this thing is going to mount like right here, but it's got to have these, these grommets here. So I'll get out the old ones and look at them, but I think I have a pretty good set that's going to do the job. Um, I buy them, you know, as always at Renovated Radios, and... I, buy, I always buy more than I need because then when I come up on something like this that I've not seen before, I usually will have something that works. So if you remember, we have a, uh, a screw and a lock washer and a, and a thick flat washer before going into the grommet, and the grommet itself has a little spacer in it. Well, that, that little flat wash or that little lock washer is a, you know, a split lock washer and that was always, see how that's flattened out? I want to replace these. I like to use star washers. You use what you want. But I'm going to grab some star washers. This might be kind of tough because the, these uh, screws are just the right size to be too big for my star washers. And I might be stuck using split washers. I don't like to use them and I don't have many of them. Okay, guys. What I do have just a few of from my back in my Volkswagen days are uh, these wavy, this is something the Germans like to use a lot, these wavy uh, spring washers. They're lock washers. Okay, so I'm going to use that. Put a flat washer on like, like I'm supposed to. You see how that wavy washer is? It does the same thing that a split lock washer does. It provides pressure on this without interfering much with the torque that it takes to tighten this so that it doesn't want to work loose. What I did not say also was that I do have these grommets right here. These uh, um, these came from renovated radios as always. And these grommets I think are going to work just fine. They're roughly the same diameter as the old ones. 
is I'll just go ahead and put this this bushing in here. It hurts if it doesn't hurt if you get them a little wet. I won't say how I do that. And they'll fit right in there. See that? Nice. And it just so happens that I have three of them. Perfect. It's time for me to get a hold of Renovated and order a bunch of a bunch more um, of these grommets. So that'll have to be soon. They're really a pain in the butt to get in if you don't uh, quote unquote lubricate them a little bit. And um, they're really easy if you do lubricate them a little bit. If you don't, you risk tearing them because this kind of rubber tears fairly, not easily, but easier than you might think. These don't cost much and uh, they're worth every single penny. And Renovated does not rip you off on shipping charges. They're pretty good. So I've been really, really pleased to work with them. I hope they're around for a long time because I'd be sort of screwed without them. All right, there we go. Three new grommets. So what that means now is I got a good location now to mount these feet. The mounting of the feet is really the easy part. The hard part's going to be connecting all these leads. So I know where these leads go. I don't need to have the tape on. The tape's going to be a real pain in the ass to get off later. So let me get it off now. And there's nothing wrong with this wire. Um, I've had people ask also, well, shouldn't you replace every wire in a restore? And the answer to that is, of course not. You want, there's no reason, if there's no reason to replace it, if the wire is not bad, then leave it alone. Besides, replacing it can introduce other problems. You can change the wire dress without meaning to and cause, you know, noise or hum. You uh, change, certainly change the look of the radio, which to a lot of people, that's a big part of the value. Uh, it is for me on certain ones. You know, you don't want to change the look. Now, sometimes you have to, right? You, we all know about the the uh, late 30s, very early 40s, you know, exploding rubber insulation on, on the wire used, especially on Philco's and Zenith's and RCA's. You know, when the wire insulation virtually leaps off of the, the uh, conductor because the rubber dries and cracks. We all know about that. But uh, there are a lot of radios that don't have that problem. And one of the things I enjoy about working about on 50s radios is they typically got be, have gotten beyond that. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, so I'm going to park these out of the way if I can. And I'm going to go ahead and bring this over here. Now remember, remember, I want to try and keep these leads the same shape if I can. Because there's a wire dress thing going on there too. They have taken a set. And they'll kind of land where I want them to land if I'm real gentle with them. So um, it's not easy to do that. But sometimes it's really worthwhile. So um, it's going to take a few minutes here. And I may not get it right, but it's worth trying. You just kind of feed them down where they look like they are supposed to go. And then uh, you, you deal with whatever you get from there. You want to try and get the wires down below deck because if you don't, they'll get they'll want to get stuck when you bolt this thing in. There's one stubborn one here. All right. So my problem is this wire right here does not want it to go down where I want it to go. And you know I am fooling around the band switch. So I want to be real careful about that. I don't know what the, the deal with it is. I might just have to mount this thing and then deal with that wire. So let me tilt this back and kind of get one of these started. See if we can see what you're, we're doing here. Here's one of those grommets right here. That, that one in the back. Now this this grommet is a little bit maybe a tiny bit thicker than the original and uh, it seems like Stuart Warner liked to use small screws so 
you have to compress it a little bit by pushing on it when you start to screw it together. So what I'm going to have to do is very carefully put this on loosely so that I can maneuver it a little bit as I'm kind of getting these wires positioned because they don't want to go through as easily as they going in as they did coming out. Remember we just pulled, we just lifted this out and the wires just kind of followed it. Okay, grab our screwdriver. You're probably getting a really nice shot of the back of my head right now. Well guys, I tried really hard, honestly I did, to install this thing with the camera on, but it about drove me crazy, so I finally had to take the camera away. So most of what I did, you did not see. But I thought I'd show you the result anyway. So let's see if we can turn the chassis around. You might be able to see it better. Okay, if you look close, you can just see one of the grommets right here and one of the grommets up here. Okay, those are, there are three of them. There's one on this side over here too. And you can see that the, now the tuning condenser fits nice and tight, but without being absolutely rigid, so it's nicely suspended. And uh, that's going to work out great. Now, the first point of order here is going to be to uh, reestablish the connection between these wires and the uh, little ground connections on these plates. Remember, it was the second plate from the front and the last plate from the front. So I'll take care of doing that. Okay, let's see if we can see anything while we work here. Uh, maybe I can show you what I'm doing here. It's, it's, it's a little tough, but we can give it a try. I put an alligator clip on here, and I'm going to try hitting that with the soldering iron. I'm going to get it nice and hot, and uh, see if I can't melt some solder to that. I think I'm going to wind up using that big soldering gun that I have. Let me go in there with it cold and see if I'm able to even get to it. Okay, I am now hooking up the leads from that tuning condenser. This is lead number five. All right, we'll solder that in just a minute. All right, let's uh, throw a little uh, solder juice to the joint here. I kind of like to be quick about it when it involves coils. This one doesn't have too much, but a lot of them have a lot of wax on them. You don't want to go about melting that if you can help it. Now remember from the video, the earlier in the video series, I said that this number three was up here on the band switch. And um, number four was down here. So I have to find the wire that goes to this, but I left the terminals clean. And that is also an indicator. You know, you, you remove the solder, of course, and then you clean them off and they stand out among all the other terminals. There it is, hiding from me. Well, sometimes it's like doing surgery. You got to get that sucker in just the right place. After all that fussing and fighting, I finally got them on their terminals. Sometimes it's easy to put these uh, tuning condensers back in, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it looks easy and it's hard. Um, it's not very often that it looks hard and it's easy, but it does happen. Oh, 
Okay, those were the last two joints to solder around that tuning condenser. I don't see anything that's loose or needs to be fixed, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next step, which is going to be the top side. So let's take care of the top side. We got the tuning condenser in. So next, it's going to be, let's put the, all the uh, auxiliary pieces on the tuning condenser and uh, go from there. Okay guys, well it's getting late. It's Monday night and I've got to get up and go to work in the morning. So I think it's time to wrap this one up for now. We'll cover the top side next time around in part five. There's going to be plenty to do there and this video is getting long anyhow. So uh, let's move on. So for right now, from your Western Outpost in Salt Lake City, this is Michael and that's all for now.